Peter, in chapter 9, verses 1 to 19, and this can be found on page 1102 of the Church Bibles. That's page 1102, Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest who are all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You might want to keep your Bibles open as we're going to look at some key passages tonight. I'd just like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here, whether old, new, or visiting. My name's Michael. I've the, been the ministry assistant this year at St. Nick's, which means I make a lot of tea and coffee. Um, so I have a myself up here tonight. I'm still not sure. Um, probably Sunday with the gaffers away on holiday. But um, this is my first time preaching. So do extend merciful judgment upon me. Um, but I would like to seriously say if anything arises from tonight's sermon that is unclear, that you're not happy with, or that you want to respond to, please see me at the end. Um, We find ourselves tonight with an embarrassment of riches, so I do want to get straight into it, but before we do, let me say a quick prayer for each of us. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are gathered here tonight. May your word speak to the hearts of each one of us tonight, producing lasting fruit, May your name be glorified by this time we spend together. Amen and amen. I want to begin tonight by asking, who is the most sceptical person you know? Is there someone you just wouldn't have dreamed inviting to church because you know they are going to be resisting to ever stepping foot inside a church or hearing the gospel preached? Some with good reasons, perhaps, while others have false prejudice and perceptions. Perhaps some people already have strong convictions in their own worldview. Perhaps they believe in science alone and don't need all that supernatural stuff. Perhaps they want to live their life how they want and don't need anyone else telling them what to do or say. Perhaps they are angry with God. In a 2015 interview for Irish TV, Stephen Fry was asked what he would say if he was confronted by God at the pearly gates of heaven. His response was this. I'd say bone cancer in children. What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that it's not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world that is full of injustice and pain? That's what I would say. If it was created by God, he is quite clearly a maniac. 
but a maniac, totally selfish. We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him. What kind of God would do that? End quote. Now you might be forgiven for thinking, well, there's someone who's never going to come to faith. But hold your horses for just a moment, because tonight we have before us the story of Saul, a man I would like to argue was much further away from Christ than Stephen Fry or anyone else we may know. Let us look at verses 1 and 2 in tonight's passage. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now I work in a pub through Gateshead, and I thought some of the people there were quite hostile to the Christian faith, but I will count my blessings from now on. I didn't realise how good I had it. Check out our man Saul with his murderous threats and want to imprison those belonging to Christ. He is actively seeking to destroy and stop the Christian movement from spreading. But even the hardest heart can be touched. Let's look together at verse 3 and see how the Lord reaches out to Saul. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now there are a couple of things I would like us to note from this particular bit. The first to point out in this section is that Jesus asked Saul why he's persecuting him, indicating that by persecuting the church, Saul is in fact persecuting Christ himself. Did Jesus not teach us in his earthly ministry when he says, Truly I tell you, whatever I did for one of the least and brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus is like a big brother here. He's saying, if you're messing with the Christians, you're messing with me. Now the second point is, Jesus gets Saul's attention. Well, that might be a bit of an understatement. It would be more accurate to say Jesus knocks Saul in the next week by a light from heaven that blinds him and he knocks him to the ground. A bit like me the last time I was in a boxing ring. <laughs> but listen to this. God uses extraordinary means here, but it still demands a response from Saul. For example, just a few weeks ago, in my secret life as a publican, I was talking to a regular there who shared with me a vision and out-of-body experience he had had. In it, he was lifted out of his sleeping body and was looking down upon it. He was asked by what he could only describe as something of an angelic figure if he wanted to return to his body or go with the angel. He asked to return to his body and his request was granted. Now he very honestly told me that this experience should have produced in him a response to believe and follow God but he hasn't yet acted upon this. Now Saul too is clearly affected by his encounter. He follows the Lord's command to go into the city and spends the following three days fasting and praying. It would be fair to say Saul is a Christian now, right? Well, not quite yet he isn't, and this is something we have to understand. The flash of light does stop him in his tracks, and it is looking more promising. But he hasn't yet given his life over to Jesus, and this is key. I think first we need to go back a little bit to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. We read that Saul gives his approval to the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, despite Stephen's prayer for the forgiveness of those who put him to death. It appears at first glance to have had little effect on Saul, only spurring him on further in his efforts to persecute the church. Now Stephen would not see the fruit of his prayer ripen, yet it must have found its way into Saul's heart. Listen to what St. Augustine has to write on the issue. If Stephen had not prayed, Paul would never have preached. But Stephen's prayer, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, was such a comprehensive plea for his murderers that I can well conceive of him fixing his tearful gaze upon that young man named Saul and in his thoughts including him in that petition and asking the Lord not to lay it to his charge. And the Lord did not lay it to his charge. Because, said he, I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. End quote. We see that up until the end, Stephen was faithful, and God uses his faithfulness in helping him bring into the church its fiercest persecutor. Let this be a reminder to us that if Stephen had not prayed, the church may never have had Saul. 
So we have Stephen starting the process off by praying for his enemies. Then we have the Damascus Road. Yet Saul is still not a Christian. One more thing is needed. What is needed, I think, can be found in verse 10. A faithful disciple called Ananias. Now, Ananias is someone we know little about. We have no seminars in his honor or great schools named after him. But see how the Lord uses him mightily. The Lord calls him in a vision to go to Saul, and not surprisingly, he is very reluctant, given Saul's reputation. Go with me to verse 13, where he says, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Now, I couldn't help chuckle here at Ananias' very real response. It is as though he thinks the Lord hasn't read this month's church letter or the latest treats from the church in Jerusalem. He's basically saying, he's basically saying, oops, sorry. He's basically saying, you're going to send me to Saul? Don't you think this fella? You're going to send me to this fella? And do you not know what he's doing? As if God didn't know. God responds by telling him to go. And unknown to Ananias, God has a plan for Saul. That is to use him to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Despite much fear and trembling, he is faithful in his response to God's call on him. Notice in verse 17 how he addresses Saul. He calls him brother. The dreaded fanatic was received as a member of the family. I'm not sure my response would have been so grateful. Imagine laying your hands on someone that was on the way to arrest you and have you put in prison. Yes, Saul, despite his past, receives a costly demonstration of love. And it is only after this encounter with God's faithful servant that Saul is baptized. And now we are over the line. And now we can rejoice that Saul has come to know Christ. And now we can see the three major encounters that bring souls to Christ. First, the prayer of Stephen. Then Saul's vision on the road to Damascus. And then Ananias is placing his hands on Saul and receiving him as a brother. Let this passage be a reminder. God uses us regardless of our rank, status, or reputation, as instruments to reach out to those who do not know Christ. That includes all of us here tonight. And it can happen that those we know who are opposed to the word of God may actually be influenced by our faithful discipleship in Christ. Just like Ananias, I wonder who God is calling us to go to. And to those of us here tonight who do not know Christ, I wonder how God is looking to reach out to you and who he is using to do so. Whether or not we see the fruit of our discipleship, it's not for us to worry about, but we are called to be faithful to God's call on our life, whatever that may look like for each one of us. An illustration of this is the conversion story of Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century. On his way to his scheduled appointment, a snowstorm forced him to cut short his intended journey and to turn into a primitive Methodist chapel, where he claimed God opened his heart to the message of salvation. There was no more than a dozen or 15 people present. Even the minister had failed to arrive because of the weather. It was the wrong church, the wrong congregation, the wrong preacher. Into the pulpit climbed a thin-looking man, a shoemaker or tailor. Spurgeon was never to know anything about him, but he introduced his text as Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Spurgeon goes on to say, The standing preacher had not much to say, thank God, but that compelled him to keep on repeating his text, and there was nothing more needed by me at any rate, except this text. Spurgeon later said, I thank God I owe my conversion to Christ to an unknown person, who certainly was no minister in the ordinary sense of the term, but who could say this much, Look unto Christ and be saved, all the ends of the earth. So when Jesus is working through us, let us remember that anyone can come to faith. How the church must have mourned when it lost Stephen, such a strong character ready to preach the gospel in the face of adversity and persecution. Who could take his place? God found his replacement among Stephen's enemies. He brought Saul to faith through the help of the miraculous, the flesh and light, but also the ordinary, that is, to Ananias' his faithfulness to God's call on his life. God takes the initiative to save the least likely people, so let us not pronounce anyone as hopeless as far as coming to know Christ is concerned. 
As Paul said in 1 Timothy, the fact that the worst sinner could be converted is a sign the least likely people can be saved. And this includes Stephen Fry or Richard Dawkins. Such realities should encourage us to dream about people coming to know Christ, to pray for others to come to know Christ, and to work towards others coming to know Christ. While we should always be looking to grow in our faith, our discipleship does not mean having all the answers, knock down arguments, but we look, should look to lead people into a personal relationship with the risen Lord. So I want to end where I began. Are there some people who are too hard a nut to crack, too distant or hostile to want to come to know Jesus? Well, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the story of D.L. Moody, who prayed for a hundred of his friends to come to know Christ. During his life, 96 of those friends became Christians. It's still an effort indeed, but you might be asking, what happened to the other four? Did God forget about them? Of course he didn't. At Moody's funeral, the final four give their life to Christ also. I would like you to keep on your hearts and minds this week someone you may know who doesn't know, who yet know Christ and who you could be praying for. And I ask you to be faithful in this. And for those of you who do not know Jesus, my prayer is that you may come to know him and his love for you. For as Justin Welby has said, the best decision anyone can ever make is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Let us take a few moments now to reflect and I will end with a prayer. God, that you may help us to be faithful this coming week to your call on our lives. Give us your strength, God, that like Stephen, we may pray for our enemies or those we find really difficult to have to be with or work with. And that like Ananias, we may reach out to those we don't want to go to, remembering you have a good plan for the life of every person. And we pray for those who don't yet know you, God, who feel far away from you or are angry with you. May the brightness of your light flash around their hearts so that they may come to know you and your love for them. We pray this in the powerful name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.